Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Skillshare. So, a few months ago, I made a video covering the 1994 Spider-Man animated series, and I talked about where it succeeded, where it failed, and the biggest problem facing the show's producers. The network censorship that did things like make it so Spider-Man could never actually punch anyone. But today, I'm going farther back. Much farther. To 1967, and the first appearance of the Web Slinger on TV in ABC's Spider-Man a show probably best known these days for the countless memes it spawned, as well as its iconic theme song. But the more I rewatched and read about this series, the more interested in it I became. Because honestly, it's just a really, really weird show. I feel like now when you see the show mentioned, it's because of the memes. But the content itself just isn't discussed that much. So I decided to set the jokes aside for a bit and really take a look at this bizarre version of the Spider-Man franchise and its surprisingly complicated production history. I think the thing that really makes the 67 series feel strange when you're watching it now is just how still it is. There is a really noticeable lack of motion in the show, especially outside of the swinging segments, as it basically tried to get away with as little movement as possible. The reason for this is obviously budgetary, but it goes a bit deeper than that. Animation in the late 60s was in a pretty tough spot. Sure, huge companies like Disney were still doing okay with The Jungle Book being released in October of 1967, but if you were a smaller studio, things didn't look so good. The majority of animation being produced back then was for theatrical shorts. You know, like a Roadrunner cartoon that would play before a feature film in theaters across the world. But those were quickly falling out of fashion, as the model kind of transitioned into what we know today. A lot of trailers, and then straight into the movie. This hit animation studios really hard, with a ton of them going bankrupt, eventually including the company that produced the first season of Spider-Man. Still, many animators were hopeful that television would help offset the fall of the theatrical short and save the industry. And it did. Kind of. See, animation was, and remains, incredibly expensive. And for TV networks that had seen a lot of success from shows with really low production costs like Captain Kangaroo and Bozo the Clown, they saw no real reason to spend anywhere near the level of money that theatrical shorts cost. Now there were exceptions, like the Peanuts specials, but those aired in prime time for the whole family. If you were working on an animated cartoon airing on Saturday morning, chances are you were working with a shoestring budget and with very strict, very short deadlines. Spider-Man 1967 makes a lot more sense when watched with that knowledge. These animators were working under pretty impossible circumstances. No matter how talented they were, their main goal was just to have a finished episode, not to make a masterpiece. And that was hard enough, and it only got harder as the team was given less and less money and put on tighter and tighter deadlines every season. With that in mind, I'm actually kind of impressed with this show. Is it great? No, but it has a lot of personality, which is more than I can say about some Spider-Man animated shows. The first season is probably what most people think of when picturing this cartoon. The iconic theme song, the classic villains, it's all there. Rewatching these is kind of an interesting experience. Many season one stories are pretty straight adaptations of early Lee and Ditko comics, but pretty simplified and stripped down, which is kind of the opposite of what we're used to at this point. I've seen and read so many versions of like the Scorpion's origin story, but I've never seen it this minimalist before. Every movement on screen or line a character says is only included because it's 100% essential to move the story forward, but with really fun 60s jazz in the background. Every character is boiled down to their most core attributes. Peter Parker is a shy nerd, made very clear from his constant fumbling attempts to ask out Betty Brant, usually giving up halfway through. They really go for a Superman thing here with voice actor Paul Soles giving Peter a really nervous energy, while Spider-Man himself sounds more like a 45-year-old insurance salesman. What's the matter, run out of spider powers? J. Jonah Jameson is also in his most pure, concentrated form here. He really, really hates Spider-Man, and he really wants pictures of him. Period. 
No deeper motive or more nuanced personality to be found, at least in these early episodes. The first season is easily the most faithful to the comics the show ever was, but there's still some pretty weird stuff in here. Take the episode The Witching Hour. This is the first TV appearance of Green Goblin, maybe Spider-Man's most famous villain. But instead of setting up the mystery of who he is, or building a story that has him going after Spider-Man, the episode is about the Green Goblin stealing a book of witchcraft, taking over Jameson's mind by getting him to read aloud Latin from a classified ad he placed in the Daily Bugle, Santiago Vanitas to Supernas. Klaatu! Miranda! <laughs> And then trying to call forth a bunch of spirits in a graveyard because he wants to join them, I guess? These things look straight out of Casper the Friendly Ghost, and in my favorite scene in the episode, they immediately decide that Goblin isn't cool enough to team up with them. You are not fit to join our evil band. It's really weird, and made even more funny by the fact that I don't think the words Norman Osborn are ever said on the show. Like, as far as I know, the Green Goblin is an actual goblin in this universe. I guess a goblin with, like, a lot of knowledge of newspaper classified ads. But it's in seasons 2 and 3 that the show goes in a really weird direction, for an interesting combination of reasons. A new showrunner was brought in to run things, Ralph Bakshi, who would later go on to be an indie animation legend, with movies like Fritz the Cat and Fire and Ice. This was his chance to prove to the industry that he could bring in a show on time and on budget. And both were in short supply. The Bakshi era of the show is definitely the most interesting, because I think it's the cartoon at both its best and its worst. The first episode he did, Season 2's The Origin of Spider-Man, is the single greatest episode of the show's run in my opinion. The composition of the scenes and the real contrast between darkness and bright colors is a lot more stylish and compelling than Season 1. And as far as adaptation of Spidey's origin story goes, you could do a lot worse. But the reality of show running soon set in, and eventually Bakshi's job became less about making quality and more about finding creative ways to reuse footage. As the episodes go on, the reduced budget becomes really obvious. Now, some of that style is still there, but it's hamstrung by the fact that the character movements seem more limited than ever. And pretty much every pose Spider-Man strikes is one you've seen a dozen times before. When they were running out of money, the show would simply fill time by having Spider-Man do the same few swings he does in the title sequence, but against a different background. This really reached its peak in the episode Phantom from the Depths of Time. In it, an alien world is attacked by giant robotic bugs being controlled by a Skeletor-like villain. One of the alien hostages manages to send out a distress signal, which can only be picked up by Spider-Man's spider sense. So Peter Parker hops in a spaceship, makes it to the alien world, swings around the planet for a pretty long time before defeating the villain and his assistant Igor. Then he jumps back in his ship, which, side note, I think the show just ignores that it got ripped in half by giant bugs a few minutes earlier and heads back to New York. If this doesn't sound like a 60s Spider-Man story to you, that's because it isn't. The producers, strapped for time and money, decided to take the majority of animation from another show they worked on called Rocket Robin Hood, which was basically a cartoon about Robin Hood set in space. So they would dip into animation and villains they had created for that show and basically swap out Robin Hood for Spider-Man resulting in some of the most weird stories ever told with the character. Honestly, recapping episodes like Revolt in the Fifth Dimension feels more like describing a dream than anything from a Spider-Man cartoon. But in the end, I think that might be Spider-Man 1967's real legacy. The mixture of classic Spidey stories and these bizarre makeshift episodes result in one of the most unique versions of the character ever produced. In an interview Ralph Bakshi did with The Amazing Spider Talk, the animator makes it clear that he really liked the character and tried to do the best he could with Peter Parker and company under pretty tough circumstances. He didn't always succeed, but I'm not sure I'd trade this version of Spider-Man 67 for a more polished one because what we have is pretty great in its own weird, stilted way.
You know, Ralph Bakshi's struggle to do a lot with a little on this show reminds me of being an independent creator, where you just try to do your best in a really crowded online landscape. And if you're looking to stand out, I definitely recommend going freelance, building and branding your own success on Skillshare. This class is a great way to learn how to market yourself and make a living doing what you love online, taught in a really smart but straightforward way. And you can check it out right now on Skillshare. Whether it's marketing, writing, animation, or just finding something fun to learn, there's a course for you. Because Skillshare has over 25,000 courses to pick from. So click on the link in the description below and get two months of access to all those classes absolutely free. Go to skl.sh slash captainmidnight21. That's skl.sh slash captainmidnight21. Here's a special tip for the fellows and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 Flight Patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.